Welcome back. Today we'll be talking about detecting BGP prefix hijacking. In the last video, we saw BGP being used as a tool to implement censorship on the internet, and we're going to follow that up with examining attacks on the BGP protocol itself. As with the other papers we've looked at, we're using the slides created by the paper authors. I don't usually comment on the design of these presentations, but in this case I must say, please don't ever use Comic Sans in a professional document. Okay, moving on. So we'll talk a little bit about what BGP prefix hijacking is and how it can be detected. We'll see the system that the authors of this paper developed for detecting it, and then some results after running it for a significant period of time. As we know, BGP is the glue that holds the internet together. Here we have an AS level graph showing the AS paths that are being advertised from one autonomous system to another. So AS7 is advertising prefix F with path 7 to AS1. Then 1 advertises the same prefix with the AS path 1.7, and then it reaches AS4. However, we have malicious AS8 also advertising prefix F with an AS path of 8. So when AS4 sees these two paths to F, it will default to taking the shorter one. So it will route traffic to F over to AS8, and then AS8 has either managed to cause a partial denial of service against AS7, or perhaps they're going to do something malicious with this traffic, such as man in the middle it, before somehow getting it to AS7. We note that this attack is incomplete because ASs that are further away from AS8 will still use the correct path via AS7 to get to the prefix F. Though the most common type of hijacking is black holing, where the packets are dropped by the attacker. In some cases, these are not malicious, but simply a misconfiguration, and a couple of noteworthy events have been China Telecom hijacking 15% of the internet, and in 2008, Pakistan Telecom hijacking YouTube for a couple of hours. These hijackings are relatively obvious because connectivity to the prefix in question simply breaks the traffic as black hole. However, if the attacker is more sophisticated and is able to either pretend to be the destination, one can imagine an attacker pretending to be PayPal or a bank website, for example, then the user may be fooled, or the traffic could be intercepted and uh, some sort of man in the middle attack perpetrated before forwarding the traffic to the real destination. Both of these, of course, motivate the need for end to end security, such as HTTPS. So, how do we detect prefix hijacking? The fundamental problem here is that there's no master database saying what autonomous system is allowed to originate what prefixes. If there were, then preventing hijacking would be simple because you simply don't allow NAS to originate a prefix that it doesn't own. Best practices, of course, indicate that every ISP should have a master list of what prefixes its customers own and are allowed to originate, and only accept advertisements for those. However, in practice, many ISPs allow their customers to advertise any prefix. So some of the challenges are that many autonomous systems are multi-homed, so they may advertise the same prefix through more than one ISP and may switch from one to another. This can also happen when there's a backup link in place. And of course, there are always changes in policy or failures in the network that cause AS paths to change every hour of every day across the internet. A hijacking event can be quite rapid and can pollute many ASs in several seconds. We also have the issue of being scalable, as with anything that deals with the entire internet. And we also note here that there's a problem called subprefix hijacking that is even more aggressive. Remember that IP routing in the internet relies on longest prefix matching. So if you, as the attacker, advertise a prefix that is longer than the one you're attacking, it won't matter how far away you are from different prefixes, all traffic in the internet will take the longer prefix, even if the AS path is longer than the shorter prefix. Some of the existing techniques include control plane monitoring, which does well because it has a comprehensive view of the network. However, it has trouble with accuracy. And on the other hand, there is data plane probing to monitor connectivity to the prefixes However, that really suffers on the scalability side of things, and it can't necessarily differentiate between a subprefix and the original legitimate prefix. And of course, we could combine the control plane and the data plane methods together, but this becomes a more complex and challenging system. So the authors are proposing the system they call Argus, which correlates the data plane and the control plane. And at least in the minds of these authors, have perfectly achieved all of their design goals. So now we'll look at how Argus works. We know that there should be a relationship between the data plane and the control plane. When everything is working correctly, the data plane and the control plane operate in sync. So now when we observe changes in the control plane, we can perform active probing in the data plane to confirm the events that are taking place. 
In our first case, we see that in the data plane, we can probe from both the normal AS and an affected AS to the target successfully. This indicates that everything is working as it should, and it is probably just a case of traffic engineering advertising the same prefix from multiple ASs. On the other hand, if the probes from both the normal AS and the affected AS fail, it's an indication of route failure. We can't assume that this is somehow a malicious event when even unaffected ASs cannot reach the destination. In the case C, that only the affected AS is able to reach the destination, then we would have to assume that this is some sort of route migration or backup link being enabled because the unaffected ASs are the ones that can't reach the destination. And so in this case, we're really only interested in the case D, where the normal ASs can still reach the destination as they could before, but the affected ASs cannot. So this is a sign that the new advertisement with the new origin is black holing the traffic. In terms of infrastructure, Argus relies on public route servers or looking glasses. These allow both the control plane and the data plane to be observed by showing the BGP route tables and pinging the destination. So we have a vantage point that's participating both in the control plane and the data plane of the network. In this example, we see that there are eyes or looking glasses in AS 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and some of these are affected and some are unaffected. And so they can all try to reach F and then figure out what's going on. We see that there is a vector constructed in the control plane of which ASs are affected. And then in the data plane, we construct a vector of which ASs are able to reach the destination. And then we look at the difference to construct a fingerprint. So in this case, we're showing that I2 is affected by the anomalous route. However, it is still able to reach the destination. So then combining all of these I's and whether they're affected and able or unable to reach the destination at the data plane, we can categorize the event into one of the four categories that we mentioned before. Given a prefix hijacking event, we can subcategorize this into different types of anomalies. The most simple one that we've been mentioning so far is simply the origin anomaly, where there's a new AS advertising the prefix. However, it's also possible that a new AS claims to be adjacent to the origin of the prefix. And this is an adjacency anomaly where those two ASs weren't peering before and suddenly they are, but the traffic going through this new peering doesn't reach the destination. And then in the last example, the attacker doesn't even create a false adjacency between itself and the origin. It just inserts itself with a false adjacency to some other AS in the path where it's able to advertise a shorter path to some of its peers. So those are the principles behind the Argus system. Now we'll see how they implemented it. The Argus system is taking in data from multiple sources, including a live PGP from BGPmon. So that's how it's monitoring the control plane. And then it's also bringing in a daily trace route from Kata. But this is for it to find responding IP addresses in different prefixes without doing scanning of the entire internet. Then with these two inputs, it's doing hijacking identification based on the BGP feed alone. And when it detects an anomaly, it looks up the live IPs that it's learned from the Kata daily trace route information and sends out probe requests to multiple looking glasses on the internet. From these, it can then identify the fingerprint and identify the event as either malicious or otherwise. Before making this presentation, the authors were able to run the system for over a year and were able to utilize almost 400 looking glasses as eyes, although these were concentrated in only 41 transit ASs. So what did they find? During that time, they saw about 40,000 anomalous route events, of which about 220 were classified as stable hijackings. Looking at the fingerprint of these events, the majority had a strong fingerprint between 0.95 and 1. To confirm whether these events were true or not, they contacted network operators. This is typically a difficult task, but they got 10 confirmations and no rejections of their assertion of hijacking events. They also compared these with route origin authorization, which is an attempt to create a database like I talked about before that says which origins are allowed to advertise which prefixes. However, out of all the anomalies observed, only 266 had a record in this database. However, there were no false positives identified against that database. Based on internet routing registry records, there were almost 4,000 anomalies with IRR records, of which about 0.2% were indicated to be false positives. Although it is known that these records may be out of date. So how fast is Argus? Based on the CDFs, we're seeing that 60% of the detection can occur in less than 10 seconds. And given that convergence of BGP in the internet takes on the order of tens of seconds, this is a very reasonable time frame within which to be detecting malicious events in BGP. 
So now let's look at some interesting statistics about the different events observed. Classifying the anomalies, we see that about half of what was observed were origin AS anomalies, the simplest case that we mentioned before. And the other half were split between adjacency anomalies and policy anomalies. Of those identified as hijackings, more than half were the origin AS anomalies, and a much smaller number were adjacency anomalies and policy anomalies. In terms of how long the hijackings last, over 20% last more than 10 minutes. And we see that this graph has a long tail because hijackings lasting a long time, such as months, also exist. We also see that the vast majority of the hijacks prefixes are the most specific advertised prefix. So while accidental hijacking, we would not expect to target any particular prefix length relative to what's already being advertised, this points to the malicious nature of the hijacking in that they are targeting the most specific prefix, which is the one that will propagate the furthest through the internet. However, only 10% of stable hijackings are sub-prefix hijacking, which as we mentioned before, has the potential to get 100% coverage in terms of the number of ASs it can pollute. In terms of scale, these stable hijackings are able to pollute a large percentage of transit ASs, and the pollution happens on the order of minutes. The first 50% tend to happen within 20 seconds, and within two minutes, 90% of the internet ASs are able to be polluted. So why do these happen? For the origin anomaly hijackings, for the small fraction that were able to be confirmed, we see that missing route filters, network maintenance mistakes, and a premature migration attempt were three of the reasons. So we could classify all of those as configuration errors, confirming what we said before, that human errors account for the vast majority of internet outages. And lastly, we see sub-prefix hijacking, so an actual malicious hijacking attempt. In the adjacency anomaly hijackings, again, we see misconfiguration and an AS path poisoning experiment. And in the policy anomaly hijackings, we see again policy violations, meaning misconfigured policy filters in the routers. In conclusion, Argus, or ARUGS in this slide, achieves a number of design goals, including short delay to detection and identification, high accuracy, high scalability, a detection of subprefix hijacking, and relative ease of deployment. That wraps up our overview of BGP prefix hijacking and the Argus detection system in particular. I hope that was helpful and we'll see you on the next one. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.